we just talk generally about the security mechanisms or the approaches to implementing security in the internet. And often we talk about, when we say security, we think about encryption. We want no one to read our data, so we encrypt. This topic on internet pri privacy options covers similar issues, but also addresses the, the other security requirement of privacy. That is, not just no one seeing your data, but also knowing, no one knowing who you're communicating with. That's a slightly different issue. So we'll look at several options for how can you communicate across the internet, have your data secure, no one can see the data, and in some cases no one can see who you're communicating with, privacy. Uh, the slides, as we'll go through, there are a number of different acronyms, so that's just for reference there. I think we know them or we've seen them already. This, this set of slides gives some background on what is the internet, but I think you already know this, but we'll, some of the things that we'll uh, need to recap on to understand the privacy options. All right. uh, we know the internet is made up of a collection of networks. We know there are many different internet applications. Here's a picture of the internet. We can think there's you at one end point, and let's say if we consider web browsing as the example, all the examples I think we'll talk about are web browsing, then you want to access a web server. So we know we use HTTP to do that normally. We send a request to the web server for a web page, the server sends back that web page. Of course, the internet is much more complex than what's shown here. Another way we could view that, so to look into some of the details inside that cloud, is we can think, OK, you at home, you have your home computer, you have a home router, so these circles represent routers, and you connect via the LAN or the Wi-Fi to your home router, and then your home router has a cable or a link going to your telephone network or your cable network through your internet service provider, your ISP. So your home router, this first circle, connects into the router of your internet service provider. So think of this portion is the, the network operated by your ISP, the, the company you pay for internet access. And that ISP may connect to another internet service provider inside Thailand or outside the country, which connects to others and so on. So there may be multiple internet service providers across the globe that when we connect to a web server, our data traverses. So in general, we have your ISP connects to an another, which these circles represent routers here. They send the data via those routers and some other ISP and eventually to the ISP that the website operator uses that the server is located at. So we're going to use this diagram to illustrate how different security techniques provide privacy. Any questions about the picture? Because we'll see it come up, but you need to understand what everything is showing here. Your computer, the web server we want to communicate with, the circles are just routers. Another thing that we'll look at is that sometimes that an internet service provider will use a firewall. And the firewall, we know, is used to control the traffic going through it. So generally, the firewall may be used by your or another ISP to control what you can access outside of your home network. And it's to some extent what can come into you. So this is a firewall provided by your internet service provider or another ISP. Not your home firewall, but one by the ISP. And sometimes that firewall may be configured to block you from accessing some websites. So we'll look at, uh, we know how that can be done. We've used IP tables, for example, to block access to different services we'll look at how that can be bypassed and what the issues there are.
as an example, actually, before we go through some examples, the other thing that we need to remember is that right, we have IP addresses, our computers have IP addresses. Uh, we, I will um, hide some information about IP addresses in that in practice, usually your computer at home has an IP address which is only relevant locally inside your home network. Then you have a public IP address which is relevant for the rest of the internet because usually technologies like network address translation and private addresses are used. But to avoid having to explain that, even though you may have seen it in other subjects, we'll generally assume in all this discussion that every computer has a unique IP address in the internet and that's a public IP address. We know about domain names. Domain names map to IP addresses. So if I know an IP address, I could find out the corresponding domain name. It's possible to go in the reverse direction. DNS generally maps from domain to IP, but given that database of mappings, I can do a reverse DNS and take, given an IP address, what's the domain name? That's possible as well. We know how IP works. That's just a, a reminder if we need to look at it, the structure of an IP packet. Web browsing, you know how web browsing works. We've covered that multiple times now. HTTP requests and responses. OK, we'll not go through that. So we want to look at uh, some of the security requirements in the internet and especially privacy options. Internet security covers many different things. It's not just about encrypting data. So some of the things, and if we go back to our very first uh, topic in this course, we talked about what CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, I think one of them. <laughs> confidentiality is keeping your data secret. When we send our data, we don't want anyone else to see that data. Sometimes, or the technique we use is encryption. Authentication is about checking that the entities we're communicating with are who they say they are. So we've covered some forms of authentication, passwords for human authentication. We use keys for authentication of computers. Data integrity is about making sure that the data is not modified. If it is, that we can detect that. And we can use encryption or digital signatures to do that. Privacy, I will define as keeping your actions secret. Privacy here, we'll say, is different from confidentiality. Confidentiality is keeping your data secret. Privacy is keeping your actions secret. And the actions may be who you're communicating with, at what time are you communicating. Uh, so not necessarily the content of the communications, but how you're communicating. How do we achieve privacy? We haven't really talk, talked about that. We know how to achieve confidentiality, encrypt our data. So we'll look at some aspects of privacy. Sometimes these words are used to mean the same thing. Sometimes people will say confidentiality and mean the same thing as secrecy or data privacy. Okay. But for this topic, we'll say privacy means privacy or secrecy of your actions, and especially the secrecy of who you're communicating with. So we'll focus on, we want to keep the actions private and, of course, keep our data private, confidential. That's the focus for this topic. Why do we want to do that? Well, I think you can think of many reasons. So there's just some examples. Say, why do we want to keep confident, data confidential? Or if we're running a business so our competitors cannot steal our ideas and, and, and uh, overtake us, so that people cannot steal our money if we're accessing a bank and so on. Why do we want to keep our actions private? Well, there may be different reasons. I'm sure you can think of uh, some. If you're working at some company and you start looking for a new job, maybe you want to make sure that your employer doesn't know you're looking for a new job. They don't want to know that you're accessing some jobs website. Okay. 
Maybe you're working for a company or an organization, you've discovered they're doing something illegal and you want to report that. You want to do that without someone knowing you're, you're reporting that. Maybe you're accessing websites to learn about some medical condition. You don't want people to know that you have that medical condition. So again, this may be about keeping the information about which websites you're accessing private. Not necessarily the, the content that's being exchanged, just the fact that you're accessing a particular website. So there are reasons why we'd like to keep data confidential as well as keep our actions private. And when I, in this topic, when we talk about keeping our actions private, we'll mainly talk about keeping it private as to which websites I'm accessing. So that others cannot learn which other computers I'm communicating with. That's what our aim will be. Let's see what we've got. Let's have an example uh, before we look at the requirements. First, uh, something about identifying users. If I open my browser and go and w to an, a website, what is What is my IP address.com? I think that's the domain. I visit that website. Let's hope. So I visit this website from my browser here at SIT, and what does this, this website's located in the US, I think. What does it learn about me, this website? Well, it learns or it knows my IP address. We know that because when we send a packet, an IP datagram from browser to server, it must contain my source IP address. So the website learns my source IP address. 203.131.209.66. If you have your phone open, then maybe you can visit the same website. What does it identify you as? Try. What is my IP address.com? Tell me what IP address you have. Here's a chance to use your phone in class for a valid reason. The same, okay? I think if you go to this website, you'll be identified as having the same IP address as me. Is that right? Some may not be identical. Some may be similar to a, a using SIT internet. Okay, we'll explain why. So those that are using the SIT Wi-Fi are getting the same IP address. But we know that our computers have different IP addresses. What's happening here? Why is everyone being identified the same with the same IP address at this website? What's the technology that's doing this? Maybe Dr. Comwood's taught you this. Why? We know our computers have unique IP addresses. If I check with ifconfig, you check in your setup, you'll see we have different IP addresses. We actually have internal to SIT, we have what we call private addresses. Mine might be 10.10.6.211. Yours will be different internally. But when we send something outside of SIT, then the technology called network address translation translates that internal address into a public IP address. And the way that it works is that SIT has this one or maybe several public IP addresses which is used for everyone. So this website identifies us as this IP address and identifies not the individuals, but everyone as being the same IP address. That is because of the, the use of what's called network address translation. So this website knows my IP address 
and it knows also where I'm from, Tamasat University. So it knows my ISP because, again, IP addresses are allocated to I ISPs. And there's a public uh, database that determines which ISPs we use which range of addresses. So that's how the server, this the web server, knows to some degree who I am. It knows I'm from Tamasat University. It doesn't know I'm Stephen Gordon yet because I have a different IP address than others here, but we're also all reported as the same. But if someone wanted to find out whether who is the exact person accessing this website, they know it's from TU, then maybe with the help of the computer centre at TU, they'd find out that the person who was using that IP address at this point in time was me. So it's not too hard to then provide that further mapping of inside TU, who accessed that website at that point in time. This is an example showing that web servers can identify who the web browsers are. A, a server knows who is contacting it. And we'll assume in the further, further discussion that uh, the server, uh, without other mechanisms, will know who is contacting it. We'll come back to the requirements. I want to talk about the assumptions before that. Uh, all right, we're going to talk about how can we provide different security mechanisms and in, when we do that we'll make these assumptions. We'll, when we use encryption we'll assume someone cannot break those encryption algorithms. Okay? If we use encryption then the data is confidential. Uh, the path that we take between your browser, you and the server may change. That I think will not be so important. We'll assume that all computers and users can be uniquely identified by IP address. Now, our example just showed us that that's not entirely true. The website didn't uniquely identify me, it identified someone inside SIT or TU. But with a little bit further work, they could map it down and uniquely identify me. So we'll assume that an IP address uniquely identifies the user. And if internet service providers do block uh, access to particular websites using a firewall, then they do so based upon IP address. That is if, jump back to our picture here, if my ISP wants to block me from accessing this web server, S, what would you do? If you had to set up that firewall, you work for the ISP, what would you do to, to to block the user from accessing that web server. So you'd use IP tables or similar software to add a rule that says if the destination equals S, the IP address of S, and maybe port number 80, then drop the packet. Okay? So you could create a rule at that firewall that says if someone sends a packet, destination equals S, then drop it. Let's assume that if a firewall does try to block something, it does it based upon the IP address. It's the simplest way to do it and the most common way to do it. Uh, all right, let's now go to the requirements. So, some requirements that people would like to achieve with respect to security in the internet are listed here. Sometimes I don't want anyone but the web server to be able to read my data. If I contact a website, the data I transfer to that website and it sends back, I don't want anyone to read that. That's confidentiality, so we'd often like that. Another thing I would like is sometimes I, want, I don't want others to know who or I don't want them to know that I'm communicating with a particular server or who I'm communicating with. So I don't want others to be able to identify that I'm accessing www.facebook.com or some other website. So that's about privacy of actions. 
and we may break that into two parts. I don't want others to be able to identify that when I'm actually communicating with a server, during the communications. And that may be one requirement. A slightly different one is that I don't want them to be able to do it during communications as well as after the communications take place. That is, I access a website today and then in one month's time someone's trying to learn whether I access that website. Can they do that? That's this requirement. I would like, if I want this requirement, I want it such that they cannot in one month's time come back and maybe check all the logs of the website, check the logs from the internet service provider and find out did I access that website one month ago. So we'll distinguish between when I'm actually accessing it, can they monitor in real time and see I'm accessing it, versus can they find out what happened in the past. Another requirement that I may want is that I don't want the server to identify me. I want to access the website, but I don't want the operator of the website know it's me. And another thing is I want to be able to sometimes bypass blocks at firewalls. A firewall may stop me from accessing some website. I want to bypass that. So these are some security requirements. And the reason we're covering them is not because I want you to go and all do all these things like bypass firewalls, but just to learn about how the security requirements can be met and how the blocks can be established. I may not want all of them at the same time. And in terms of convenience, I'd like the technology we use to be free easy to use and I want it to perform well so we'll compare some different solutions with respect to security and convenience requirements. So let's look at uh, how different technologies, uh, how well they go with respect to those requirements. And in the pictures that follow I think this new notation is used so uh, We'll see U and S are the U and the web server. Uh, we'll see a VPN server shortly, V. Uh, Tor we may not see today. Uh, so let's go straight to the first case. Here's a case. You're trying to access a website You're using HTTP, normal web browsing. And the firewall is configured with a rule that says Anything that comes in, its destination is S, block it, drop that packet. If the firewall is configured like that, can you access the website? No, okay, so you cannot access the website. So using just HTTP, if the firewall is enabled, then we, can, we are blocked from accessing that website. There's nothing special about that. Uh, but we'll compare and see some other solutions where it will not be blocked, even if the firewall is enabled. So that's the simplest case. We cannot send anything out of our ISP. What if the firewall is not blocking? Okay, the firewall lets you access the website. There's no rule there. So we send our data. And using HTTP, we send the packet. The source address is mine. The destination is that of the server. The data is not encrypted. So with respect to some of the security requirements, what happens? First, the firewall, or the device here run by your ISP, can see the server you're communicating with. This device sees that this packet is from you. It's to this website. So the firewall could monitor and see who you're communicating with. If, the, if they wanted to, the firewall or the ISP running the firewall could read your data. So your data is not confidential and your actions are not confidential with respect to the firewall or more generally the ISP running the firewall. We said sometimes we'd like the data to be confidential or we'd like our actions to be private. In this case, they are not. 
Also, anyone else out on the internet between your ISP and between the server, they can also see who you're communicating with because if they intercept this packet, they can identify from the source and destination addresses it's you talking to this website. And they can see the data because the data is not encrypted. And the server knows it's you because the source address in the packet that the server receives is your IP address, so the server knows it's you. So none of the security requirements are met in this case. So this is the simplest case, just using HTTP. There is no security. So that's a simple one. What if we move to HTTPS? We know about HTTPS. We've studied how it works. Let's say the firewall is enabled. Does HTTPS help us? Does it allow us to bypass the firewall? No. With HTTPS, the IP datagram still has your address as the source and the server's address as the destination. It's just that the data is encrypted. So still, if the firewall is blocking everything to destination S, your packet doesn't get through. So what I'm saying here, using HTTPS or simply HTTP, both of them will not be able to bypass the firewall. We said one of our requirements may be to bypass the firewall. These don't work. They don't bypass the firewall. What about those other requirements? If we use HTTPS, and there's no firewall, or it's not enabled. The firewall, there's no rule to block you, but it can still monitor the packets going through. The firewall can still see, sorry, can still see the server you're communicating with. The source and destination addresses are not encrypted. They cannot be if we're sending an IP datagram. We need them to deliver it across the internet. So the firewall can still know who you're communicating with. But they cannot read the data. So this security requirement, I don't want others to be able to read my data, we can achieve that using HTTPS. Others in the internet, these other routers, maybe other internet service providers, similar with the firewall, they can see who's communicating with who, but they cannot see the data. It's encrypted. The server still knows it's me. When the server receives the packet, the source address is the, the, your address. So the point is, HTTPS can provide confidentiality of data, but it does not provide secrecy of your actions. It doesn't hide who is communicating with who. Other techniques are needed for that. So that's stuff we already know. Any questions about that before we move into things we don't know? OK. Good. So what we're trying to do, we're going to look at some other techniques, and we're going to look at these requirements. Can the firewall see the data? Can they identify who's communicating? Can others in the internet do that? Can the server identify me? And one technique to try to help with security is called a web proxy. Quite simply, it's, a, it's another, a website on the internet that you use to send your request to a, the real website via. That is, you access the web proxy, and then you tell the web proxy to access this other website. And that website, the final destination, will send the response back to the proxy, and the proxy will send the response back to you. Let's see an example.
sometimes you want to read the news. Let's see if we can find uh, an example. Sometimes I want to read the news, so I go to Google News and I click on the link. And let's see if this works. We get this. What's this? What happened? Okay, so this, what's happened here? Anyone want to guess? Blocked by a firewall by some internet service provider. So what's happened is I've tried to access some server. I'll show you which one in a moment. Uh, but my request has got to some firewall, either by my ISP or maybe an ISP beyond that, and that's determined you cannot. And it's blocked, and it's also sent back a request saying uh, you're not allowed to. It was only a news website, nothing too dangerous. Some web proxies... So here's a, just a, a, a random web proxy I found that is a website where what you can do is here type in a URL and that proxy will send the request to the website for you. And the website that I tried to visit on the, here was some newspaper in the UK called the Daily Mail. Okay? The Daily Mail. So if I copy the URL of the Daily Mail... So the Daily Mail is blocked. If I type it into the proxy, let's hope this works. We're getting close. And now I get to the website of this newspaper. It's not a very interesting newspaper, uh, but what happened is that the request to the destination website is sent from the, the proxy. And the proxy, so I send a request to the proxy, which is not blocked, and then the proxy sends the request to the final destination web server, and then the response comes back via the proxy. And eventually what I see is the website of the Daily Mail. So this effectively has bypassed the block of the firewall. If you try and visit that same website without going via the proxy, you will not uh, get access. How does it work? It's, it, with respect to HTTP, it's like this. Here's your computer. Here's the proxy server. And here's the web server you want to access what happens is that you send a HTTP GET request or a special HTTP request, not a GET, in this case a POST request, to the proxy server. And in the form field, so when I use this proxy, if we go back, here's the form field. In this field, I type in the destination URL. So when I click SURF here, what it does is that my browser sends a request to the proxy server and one of the parameters in the form is the URL of the final server. So we can visualize it like this. It's a HTTP request visiting the proxy and a parameter inside there is the URL of the eventual destination, the server. The proxy gets that and now creates another HTTP GET request to the server that I want to visit requesting the page. That web server replies to the proxy because the web server received a request from the proxy, P, therefore sends a reply to the proxy, P, including the web page. And when the proxy gets that web page, it creates a reply going back to me which contains that web page. May it also contain some advertisements or some, some information about the proxy in there. So that's how it works from a HTTP perspective. The proxy acts as a server from my perspective and a client from the 
destination websites perspective. If we use such a web proxy, how does that help with our security requirements? Let's see. A proxy with just HTTP. So the proxy is this blue router in the middle. That's some website that uh, I'm going to use to access the eventual server S. So we can think of it is that I send a packet, I'm the source, I'm sending it to the proxy, and, it, and the data inside that identifies the real web server I want to access. The firewall has a rule saying block anything which has a destination IP address of S. This packet has a destination IP address of P, so it will not be blocked. Typically, firewalls, to make them simple and fast, they don't look inside the data. They just look at the destination address, because it's much, much faster to look at the destination address than have to look through the data looking for server S. So even though the address of the server is inside the data, the firewall would not look at that. It just looks at the destination IP address. It doesn't match S, so let this packet through the firewall. The packet gets to the proxy. The proxy now creates another packet from the proxy to the web server. Containing the request, it goes to the web server. And the response will come back. Our security requirements. The firewall can read the data. Nothing's encrypted. So there's no encryption here. Others can read the data out on the internet. Again, no encryption means anyone can read the data. What else? The proxy cannot easily see who you're communicating with. Or the proxy, sorry, the firewall cannot easily see who you're communicating with. The firewall thinks you're communicating with the proxy. It doesn't think you're communicating with server S. When I say easily here, in theory it could look at the detail of this packet. But in practice, because a firewall for an ISP must handle millions of packets per second, it doesn't have the resources to look at every individual packet. Or it's, it's quite complex to do that. They can, but it's not so common. So usually the firewall will not know who you're communicating with, or it will not know you're communicating eventually with S. It thinks you're communicating with P. So that's one of our security requirements. What else? Others out on the internet, people out here who intercept between P and S, they think it's P communicating with S. They don't think it's you communicating with S. Because if they just look at the addresses, ah, IP address P is sending a packet to S. So others who intercept this packet do not know it's you communicating with the server S. And the server doesn't know it's you. The server receives a packet, the source address is P. It doesn't know it's you who is originally contacting that. So that's another security requirement in that the server doesn't identify you. A different thing in this case is that the proxy can read the data that you sent to the server. And they know it's you that's communicating, because the proxy knows that you sent the request to them and it's a request to that server. So there's no protection against the proxy knowing who you're communicating with or what you're communicating. But we have achieved some different requirements of the server not identifying you and others in the internet not identifying you and bypassing the firewall. So if you are uh, working for an ISP and you want to set up the firewall so that you can truly block access to the server, what do you need to do? If you want to set the firewall up such that this will not work, what could you do? So some of you will get jobs with ISPs. You'll need to configure their firewall. Drop every packet. So none of your customers can access the internet. You're fired tomorrow. What else could you try? Block packets to particular proxies. If you know what are the proxy websites, P, then you could set a rule. Block anything to destination P. 
But that becomes hard because there are many proxy websites and you need to, as the ISP, keep track of them and know about them and update the list on a regular basis. Anything else you could try? You can get your firewall to inspect the contents of the packets, to look at the data and do some analysis. Every time a packet comes in, don't just look at the destination address, look at what's inside the data and see is this a request to a proxy for the block server. So that's possible. The problem with that is it slows down every packet that goes through the firewall. And maybe if it's too slow, your customers become unhappy because the internet access is slow. So there's a trade-off there of if you, if you check every packet, it slows down the, the network access through your ISP and, and that's something you don't want to do to your customers. So there are solutions, but there are trade-offs with them. Last one for today. Let's switch to using HTTPS. So basically the data is encrypted. The firewall now cannot read the data. With HTTP, they could read the data. Now there's no chance to read the data because it's encrypted. Others on the internet cannot read the data. So using HTTPS allows us to keep our data confidential as well as the other security requirements. So comparing no HTTP or normal HTTP versus HTTPS, the difference is we keep our data confidential with HTTPS. Now this requires the proxy to be able to decrypt and encrypt again. So the proxy can still read your data and know who you're communicating with. So you must trust the proxy in this case. On Thursday next week, during our last lecture, we'll look at using VPNs to do a similar thing and how VPNs can be uh, used to achieve similar security requirements. And that will about finish us for this topic.